Hey guys, welcome back to No Tucks Allowed, that uh, podcast that's totally not about a penguin. We swear, uh, we even put a big cross right in front of him and everything. Uh, I am a host, Josh, uh, and I am one of many hosts that we've had on this show, of which uh, currently there are two of them. But, you know, I can't possibly host this show by myself because that'd just be plain and boring and then I'd just be talking to myself all day. So instead, I got this uh, other guy here to join me today. How's it going today, Big Pod? Uh, doing great. Well, I'm glad to hear that uh, you're doing great and that you're willing to join me on this wonderful adventure. <laughs> so, uh, Big Pod, I know that you're using a Fedora-derived distribution. I, I'm not going to say based, even though it technically is based, but it's more derived than based, at, sort of. I yeah. mean, there's a Fedora code base involved in this. Are you excited to finally see python 2 leave the repository uh it's good idea that it leaves because you know it's python 2 security issues and well horrible code bases yeah it's python uh and did you know that the only reason it's in the fedora repository still is because of one application no Oh, well, uh, that application happens to be uh, this wonderful program called GIMP, which uh, hasn't uh, updated the the GIMP 2.99 code base that Fedora is currently shipping uh, to Python 3 yet. But GIMP came out with like this blog post earlier today saying that, hey, guys, get excited. 3.0, it's on the horizon. We're looking at late summer. Nice. And uh, so, basically, there's nothing super exciting feature-wise coming in. Coming in, GIF. It's not going to get. It's not going to make itself a better fo- Photoshop alternative, as far as I know. I mean, yes, there probably are some nice things coming. I don't delve that much into the fancy image editing, but uh, it is updating to GTK three. 10 years too late. And it is upgrading to Python 3, 10 years too late. Yeah. <laughs> Standard GIMP. And yep. maybe in 15 years, we're going to get GIMP uh, 4.0, which will get us uh, good old GTK 4 support. Yeah. And uh, I think that the only reason why that this got knocked so far behind is lack of contributors as far as i know there there the, the whole gtk3 port has been spearheaded by just one guy and uh i support and you know what if i ever see that one guy i'm gonna i'm gonna buy him a beer and probably buy him lunch too because uh he put in a lot of work yeah he had to because <laughs> uh, i i remember like way back in the day here when you know gtk3 first came out and uh pa- packages were working on making the transition from GTK2 to GTK3 uh, because uh, GTK3 implemented this thing called a global style sheet that, uh, that you know, they could use for theming. Uh, that didn't exist back in the GTK2 days. Yes, you did have GTK2 themes, but each application was kind of responsible for its own theme. The hmm. concept of a global theme was fairly new back then. Interesting. Yep. Uh, and uh, people were quickly realizing uh, that with GTK3 theming p- entirely is that uh, Adwaita is king. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which, uh, fun fact for you ricers out there. In the in the GTK3 space, there is no such thing as a non-Adwaita theme. They are all Adwaita. Why? Because Adwaita is king and every... And every uh, theme that you're installing like your monikais your uh arc darks which i know i'm a big fan of and and so on uh they're basically just calling adwaita and and writing on top of adwaita because uh, adwaita is so critical in the gtk in the gtk stack that it is yeah. hard-coded that gtk is adwaita that's why adwaita is king yeah Lighted, uh, the new lib adwaita the GTK4 has, a lot nicer about it. <laughs> a lot nicer. Yeah. 
but uh yeah so i'm happy to see that python 2 is finally leaving so maybe you don't have to call the python 3 binary uh in your yeah. terminal instead you can just yeah. call python and you know not get not get messed up on, on all your different distros because you that know, was some always distro- fun Yep, always fun. It's like, is Python Python 2 or Python 3 when I call Python? Hmm. Well, let's see. On Debian, I know it's not. On Fedora, apparently it's it it you had it's not. Uh, I know that on Arch, I believe it depends on it depends on if you're calling an AUR package or not. And then uh, NixOS, you're kind of just you don't know what's going on. But yeah, uh, some distros call their Python binary different. I yeah. mean, you, when you call Python, it's either going to be two or three, and uh, you just kind of have to figure out which one it is. The annoying part for me was calling the the pip, the Python package manager, because yeah. if, if you're trying to call the Python three version of pip, you have to call pip three for some reason. Yeah, and uh, you know it should just be the default. Yeah. But thanks, Gimp, for finally getting getting an update coming, even though it's not coming yet. But Fedora is also looking at packaging up Gimp 3 and shipping it anyway because they just want to dump Gimp, uh, Python 3 that much. Yay. Which, hey, you know what? If Fedora wants to release it before Gimp releases it, that's the Fedora thing. That's what they do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, as long as it works, that's they what actually have, matters. <laughs> they have all, all right to do so. Yeah, and uh, they have the right to do so. And honestly, compared to like other distros, when Fedora does does package unreleased software yet, uh, they contribute to that package too. Yeah. Uh, on unlike say a another distro uh, t- that's totally not green themed that uh, that uh, is an Arch derivative and is quite famous for shipping ba- unreleased or buggy pa- software packages. <laughs> not gonna say any specific names, right? Almost said it. Almost said it. Almost said it. Yeah. Okay. I caught myself. Uh, also, Big Pod, did you update your system? Yes, I update my system every day. Okay. Uh, did you update your servers? Yes. They update every oh. day automatically. Okay. Okay. Just checking. Just checking. Because, guys, big news. There's another open SSH bug. This one is uh, severe, and uh, we tried reading this uh, post that the OpenSSH team released, and neither of us actually know what the bug is. <laughs> but they've already got it patched, so just update your systems, yeah. guys. Uh, supposedly, it has something to do with long-running SSH connections that call a specific uh uh, function or feature which I believe is called obscure keystroke timing I think I might uh, be wrong yeah. I might be misreading but yeah uh, something to do with that I'm certain that uh, if you do your own dil- due diligence you could probably uh, understand it because uh, I tried reading this and it's saying that's a logic error which yeah. is a term that goes beyond me. <laughs> I think I know what what it's supposed to mean, but yeah. I I didn't wh- whenever I checked this out today and I believe I watched a video about it, I had I had no idea what's going on, honestly. And and I and I and I am a security guy a bit what I used to be, but yeah. Yeah, it's uh, something that's low level, and, uh, you know, when you get that far low level, uh, there comes a point where it's just like, you, pro- you probably need to be working in that field to understand what they're talking about. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You need to be working with that, and... I'm not. I'm not that low level. <laughs> I, I was at security of servers from from external attackers. That That was all I did. More securing stuff than actually looking at uh, vulnerabilities. 
Yeah, so uh, to quote the world famous Alan Jude from uh, back back in the in the I believe it was the TechSnap podcast days, uh, which was a fairly popular systems administration podcast, and I believe nowadays he's he's uh, running with the two point five admins. Patch your shit. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, as I I did some checking in, in on the Repology website, uh, you know that website that parses all the distribution packages to tell you if the package is available. Yeah. And uh, everybody has already submitted a package update in the latest version of of OpenSSH. So if it's not in your distro at today, it's probably going to be there in a few hours, or yeah. it might be there tomorrow. Basically, okay. I I just again read the first few lines and. First of all, it's a race condition. Yeah, so. I mean, I understand what a race condition is. Yeah, <laughs> where uh, basically you have two, you have multiple things w- watching for a certain call to come across, and yeah, uh, one just gets there before before the other one's supposed uh, to. I believe this is this this happens because multi-threading. Yep. So, when there is enough connections made, the next connection, so when enough connection to fill up certain pool, let's say, the next one will 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 cause the race condition yeah and that's when this kind of bug can happen and this is what happens and it it's primarily happening on 32-bit linux glibc systems but they believe that 64-bit systems are also potentially exploitable they just haven't demonstrated it because uh it's probably a long, longer time to get it to, to happen. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it could be because, you know, uh, there's and, a lot more. And, and, and it's funny because in one of the paragraphs I'm just reading, they have, they have a statement regarding something, some re-randomization and they, they say, yes, this is a thing. No, we don't understand why. Which is something that a programmer knows very well. Yes, it's a thing. I have no idea why it works that way. <laughs> oh, let's hear it. To quote, to quote the paragraph, exploitation on the non-glibc systems is conceivable, but has not been examined. Systems that lack ASLR or users of downstream Linux distributions that have modified OpenSSH to disable peer connection ASLR re-randomization, yes, this is a thing, no, we don't understand why, may potentially have an easier path to exploitation. OpenBSD is not vulnerable. Thanks, OpenBSD, for being awesome. <laughs> okay, and for those of you who do not know what ASLR is, because I didn't either, I had to Google it. <laughs> this appears to be address space layout randomization, which is a security technique. Yeah, uh, sounds like it's sounds like it's just like a randomized key, yeah. randomized key, which is what open S- OpenSSH keys check against. So, I guess. Yeah. So, uh, other than you know not understanding what the heck the, uh, the yeah, what the uh, heck that this thing is going on about, it's important to know that these are actually two security issues, not one. Oh, apparently, I just read that. So, first one is the race condition in SSHD, which is what we've been talking about right now. There's also a second one, which is a logic error in obscure keystroke timing, which. Uh, happens to be when when you connect to the OpenSSH server and there is a feature called obscure keystroke timing, which is already mentioned, which is on by default. It's a logic error sometimes renders this feature ineffective. So it's a minor security flaw, which means a passive observer could still detect which network packets contained real keystroke when the countermeasure was active because both fake and real keystroke packets were sent unconditionally. Uh, it's important to know that this is what this is an exact quote from their web page from this article. Okay. And it's actually broken broke some 
uh, broke some actual mitigations. This un the unconditional sending of both fake and real keystrokes. So they fixed that as well, apparently. They have in the same article they have some deprecation notices, like a deprecation of uh, support of DSA signature algorithm in early 2025. Yeah, which I think I've seen them mention that before in SSH Probably updates. Probably because so. they do a good thing and explain and do a long-running deprecation notices. Apparently, the release release disables DSA by default at compile time, so, you know, you have yeah, to enable it. Yeah, they're, they're, they're starting to get serious about it. <laughs> yeah, it's basically they're going... We still have support for it. We just don't give it to you by default. Which, you know, if you want to enable it, just uh, modify the make file. Yeah, That's basically. Uh, which, you know, it's deprecated. You should probably be moving on anyway. They have some changes and some new features, bug fixes, and some checksums. That's the, that's the article. And... Half of it I don't understand. Yep. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully you can understand what's going on with that. Yeah. Uh, if and, if all and if fails, you do, send us an email and explain it to us. Yeah. Uh, send uh, us an email. Potentially using small words. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, small words. Uh, maybe. Maybe. Uh, put it in your AI chatbot to summarize it. Because you know I'm kind of I'm kind of. I'm kind of curious as to what the, if AI can explain this better than we yeah. can. Uh, but, like, uh, you know, speaking of AI, uh, yeah. have you, uh, Big Pod, uh, I can't escape it. <laughs> Who can? Uh, I, I opened up my RSS reader. I hit the little update button to, uh, you know, find things to talk about on the show. I pulled in 200 articles. Uh, guess how many of them did not have an AI tag? Let me guess. Two. Three. Oh. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, uh, AI is getting way too prevalent, and yes. uh, so many, too many companies are putting AI in things that shouldn't have AI, or you know, relabeling things to AI. Or at least I'm, cons I'm seriously thinking that they are. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, welcome to welcome to era of AI, which is which is basically the same type of era as we saw the era of crypto, the era of NFT, the era of I don't know which. There's always an era. an era of something that doesn't yeah. pan out to be actually a good thing. Yeah, but you know, to actually talk about something that's happening in the world of AI, uh, Microsoft has decided they're going to delay recall. Yep. Which, uh, hey, it turns out that when you is when you announce this fancy new feature that uh, sounds super beneficial on like a very high level scale, uh, that and then immediately every single thing that you hear about it is that you shouldn't turn it on. <laughs> you probably should. <laughs> you can finally get through to Microsoft. <laughs> maybe, yeah. you, maybe, maybe you should uh, put that thing on the back burner, uh, but. Uh, Let's Microsoft... remember a couple of episodes ago, we talked about uh, them disabling it by default, and in their FAQ, basically saying it might be a security problem. Well, uh, now now we, now we know why why also they disabled it because of security concerns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, they they introduced some they introduced some patches to it to uh, enforce some security on it, of which. Uh, is proprietary software, so we're not going to see them. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, uh, I'm glad that uh, they heard us. Uh, maybe not specifically me and Big Pod, because, you know, there was a lot of people talk, talk, yeah. uh, saying this. But they're, they're delaying recall to test it, because uh, as we're recording this, they were supposed to be coming out with these wonderful computers that were supposed to have uh, these co-pilot uh, plus chip enabled chips on them. And they were supposed and to they be, be co-pilot be... plus branded PCs. Yeah. Like their cool. surf Surface lineup and all the PCs with the whole, with the new Snapdragon X Elite and X Plus chips. 
they're all supposed to be branded as Copilot Plus PCs. Yeah, which Yet, my understanding... The, the branding is still there. Just there is no yeah. recall. Yeah, there, there, there is no recall. But, hey, you come with Copilot. Yeah. I guess. As useful as that is. Based on what I hear, nobody's using it. Like, it doesn't come up useful. As far as I know... Programmers turn it on in VS Code just to have a laugh. The GitHub, <laughs> GitHub Copilot. It is yeah. somewhat useful to write basic long things. Sure. The, yeah, the boiler, boiler text plate, that you don't have to write. <laughs> the things you would normally have snippets for. Yeah. Now you don't have snippets, now you have an AI writing it for you bespokely. Okay. Whatever. Yeah. Otherwise, it's... It, we should remember that uh, that these LLMs, all they do is they put a word in front of a word in front of a word, and they don't know intelligently what is happening as a whole. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. But hey, at, at least they're doing something smart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, at least something. But yeah, uh, this whole AI... This whole recall AI th feature has uh, sparked some concerns internationally as well, at least compared yeah. to me. Uh, it looks like that the the UK might be uh, getting a little uh, might might be uh, getting a little curious here. Uh, says something about the Information Commissioner's Office is doing an investigation. Yeah. The ICO. saying that hey hey, hey uh, are you sure you want to do this, Microsoft? It seems uh, pretty pretty fishy. Uh, we expect organizations to be transparent with how how the data is actually being used, because uh, you know uh, we've we've unlike uh, your users, we've actually read the terms of use for Microsoft Windows. <laughs> you know, that's that's their job. <laughs> yeah. So uh, hey, uh, we might actually see we might actually see a uh, a uh, lawsuit partaking with Microsoft actually being taken serious. Potentially, potentially serious. More likely, they're just gonna do the prop, do do the proper things and yeah. put. But I also believe they there might be a there might be a delay, like a larger delay to uh, recall, like the kind that that you would label it indefinite. Yeah, <laughs> that that kind of delay. And then in a year, you you will see. A new feature from Microsoft called uh, Copilot Memories, which will be basically recall or something like that. I'm just I'm just making fun, but yeah, they're probably gonna reach just under a new name, and that will be it. Like that's a standard thing. Let's be honest. Yeah. New name, and you're done. All right, and uh, for you web developers out there, just letting you know, there's some more JavaScript bullcrap going on. Yeah. And I, I mean. I hear JavaScript and I just immediately think that there's JavaScript bullcrap. That's just my personal opinion. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm certain that there's uh, some J some uh, JavaScript developers out there that I might trigger with just saying that. Uh, then there's others. And then, you know, there's probably these uh, sysadmins who have to deploy these JavaScript websites to pull in like 130 plus thousand JavaScript libraries that go, yeah, I totally agree with that guy. Yeah. <laughs> but, hey. Uh, Big Pod, you know a heck of a lot more about this than I do because I don't delve with the web design stuff. But uh, apparently, there's something going on with Polyfill IO. Yeah. So there used to be a need for something called polyfilling, essentially filling holes when when there are holes for specifically for old browsers. Like remember the times of IE six and before Google Chrome when when standards for web web languages weren't kept up to by anyone so at that point if you wrote at the time modern javascript it was a high enough likelihood that no browser actually or maybe maybe firefox knew how to run so there was a service written so a, a project called polyfill service i believe it was if I remember correctly, it was called that basically you send a request to it reads essentially reads your code and sends you back the code 
that would actually run in the browser you're using, using the features that that browser support. That's the best I understand polyfill service. And okay, so it's basically just like a compatibility layer thing. Yes. Sort of like sort of like how Wine works. Sort of. Sort of. Except uh, Wine basically the translation, while polyfill service generated new code. Basically, oh, okay. took the took the old code. Okay, it does this, 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 this. This code can be replaced for this version with these three, three code lines. I'm gonna send it back for a as a replacement. And that ran quite well, but it was you need to self-host it, which meant who wanna do that? You're already hosting a server. Why would you host another service? Uh, logically, you would, but okay. So, so somebody who isn't who wasn't affiliated, I believe it wasn't affiliated with the project, or at least wasn't, or the o creator of the project didn't own the ori the, the domain. The, uh, the so so somebody created Polyfill IO, which is basically publicly hosted version of Polyfill service. Anybody could use it and. That became very much used. Yeah, but... and uh, so uh, well, basically, what the crux of the issue is is that uh, Polyfill.io, which is operated by this company called Funnel, which is uh, that now is operated by Funnel. So that's yeah, the yeah. part we haven't talked about. Uh, basically, I believe February it was sold to a foreign third party. This company called Funnel. Oh yeah. Yeah, I think I see this now. Okay, I just had to scroll up in the article. And basically, before that, it was hosted by someone else, by the the person who originally created Polyfill IO, not the person who created the Polyfill service, but the person who created Polyfill IO. So second party, shall we say? Okay. And then came yeah. and then that person sold Polyfill IO to this foreign third party. At which point. The original creator of Polyfill Service told to base, uh, tweet it out or message on out, whatever, that the the, serv the 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 domain was sold. You should stop using it. They they never actually had control of the domain, so yeah, you shouldn't trust the new owners. And they also said that most people don't need Polyfill Polyfills at all anymore because modern browsers now support modern features finally th thank you google chrome yeah, who knew who knew and apparently this new this new owner of polyfill io this funnel started injecting things into the generated code apparently there was some very specific redirects at very specific times for very specific devices and stuff like that so yeah you should probably rem if you're using polyfill io you should probably remove it from your code base uh, or if you still need it there is uh there is uh, something uh yeah there's a solution created. to this yeah, yeah yeah cloudflare being the good guy for once uh well you know cloudflare is actually d is a good guy a lot of the times they they are one of the most polarizing companies ever because yeah. Today they do a good thing, but then two days two, two days later, uh, they, they, they're gonna their sales team is gonna do something horrible. Yeah, uh, so. that's that's uh, life with with Cloudflare. But yes. uh, uh, before we touch on that, I want to talk about Funnel a little bit here. Uh, they ahead. claim to be based in Slovenia. Really? So you can yeah, supposedly they have an office that you can just drive up to. Wait, really? Uh, yeah, uh, supposedly, but. The listed addresses are nonsensical, uh, and their website's underlying language is Mandarin. And it may actually be, and uh, the server for that website seems to be originating from the Philippines, with a few other odd things, leading people to think that the uh, funnel might be Chinese. Yeah, la, na, let me see. <laughs> there's also a lot, there's also uh, some let letters. The uh, in their name names as I just showed it, they might not be 
not be American. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, some fun facts about companies that use that use polyfills, by the way, into it. So uh, if you're American, you're a tax company. And uh, the World Economic Forum, which I don't know how often I ever go to the World Economic website, but hey, uh, they apparently use polyfills. <laughs> and about 100,000 other websites. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of websites use polyfills, yeah. Yeah. And I I didn't know it it claimed to be based in Slovenia. That's a that's a new one, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm just reading this register article and I, and I see that I'm like, oh hey, Big Pod might know where these guys are. <laughs> uh, and, and I basically just wrote funnel and yes, funnel dot com is located in Slovenia. I was like, uh, that's a new one. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, maybe you guys uh, should uh, consider not uh, using your polyfills and, and, and instead uh, decide that, uh, hey, that's one JavaScript library we don't need anymore. So we yeah. can make our sys, we can make that certain sysadmin's uh, life a little bit nicer. But, hey, but if you need to use it, Cloudflare has a solution for you. Basically, you can use their version of polyfills service they host it basically so now now instead of trusting funnel you trust cloudflare yeah so it's just and like, uh... apparently if you're using cloudflare already and using their cdn as a middle layer apparently they're already doing some 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 changing of code so that you automatically go to to their to their polyfill service already but yeah. Don't and, uh, don't go on just go on that that it will happen. Change the code if you yeah. if you have polyfill. Either remove it or change to either Cloudflare or Fastlist version of polyfill service. Which one you trust more? But I would recommend just removing it outright. Yeah, Security honestly, you don't need it anyway, so just take it out. <laughs> the way polyfill works is very questionable and I would say insecure. Yeah, but in the meantime, if there's a if there's a sysadmin that you want to make happy, uh, just bear in mind, this podcast is self-hosted. Uh, when you download uh, this episode and listen to it, assuming that you're listening to it over a local file, yeah, there's it hits a specific web server that uh, we happen to pay for ourselves. Actually, and, uh, doesn't. Up... You're forgetting that we now have this thing called S3 bucket. Well, yeah, but it's got to talk to our web server first. That way, it can be routed to the S3. Bucket. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It it is actually talking to a third party service that basically collects statistics, which then goes directly to the bucket. Okay, I I guess. Thankfully, you're kind of, I, I did it correctly. I guess you're right about that. Yeah. Which is yep. which is why I have to actually uh, have a bit of an an announcement, so I have to be a bit more serious. Uh, if you are a new listener and you try to listen to, to any of the first four or five episodes and you were hitting a wall, the episode didn't exist. That was actually because it was missing from our last three bucket. Ah, that's why, I that's, why I, that's why I know it goes directly to the last three bucket. Yeah, because... now bear in mind, the only reason uh, we found out about this is because, you know, I decided one day I was just going to download some of the older episodes so I could uh, compare compare a couple things here. And uh, I couldn't download my own podcast. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh... Hey, Mr. Big Pod, what's going on here? And I'm going to explain, <laughs> I'm gonna explain what happened. So at the start of the podcast, we made a mistake when we set up Castapod. It, there was one value I didn't set. It was my mistake. Therefore, it we- it started saving episodes to the local storage instead of to the S3 bucket we had set up. Afterwards, when I actually figured it out, it, I, I was planning to do a migration, but because the usage of this third party middleware or mi- middle service, uh, all traffic was being routed to a specific, to, to the actual location of the of the episode and they had they they basically were doing some caching 
to the locations. At which point, ah. it's it pointed out to our pointed to our server instead of to the S S three bucket. And after a while, that cache probably expired. At which point, it stopped pointing to our server and started pointing to the S three bucket. But guess what? There was nothing in the S three bucket. At those file names. And for those of you who do not know, for from the perspective of outside usage. S3 bucket essentially works as a web server. It's essentially yep. a link you hit, and it's a box standard get get request. So, if you want to request a file that is at uh, the link slash media slash the name of the podcast episode, or in this case, some random gibberish just MP3, you just go go basically the link and the path. That's it. It's really it's a web server. Of course, it has a yeah. backend that is amazingly good that you can then upload things with and stuff like that. And it has like you can get listings and all the sort of things that web apps and stuff like that would use. But yeah, and what I had to do to fix it was get those from our server, where thankfully everything is safely stored. Download it to my machine. Then using the CLI, the right CLI, had to log in and check that that file names that are locally and the one that were supposed to be on S3 bucket were the same. And then slowly, one at a time, upload them to the S3 bucket. Slowly and carefully. <laughs> and guess what? Uh, after a while, I uploaded all the episodes. It, it took me about an hour to fix I just had yeah. to know if, I, if I'm doing it correctly because, you know, it's important. Yeah, so and I got my works. phone and I put up our podcast here, my antenna pod, and uh, I can successfully download those episodes now. So, yes. uh, hey, guys, I know that at least one of you out there loves listening to backlogs of podcasts. So our backlog works now. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, uh, just a reminder, all that work that we just put in to uh, run this podcast, it's not free. And, of yeah. course, uh, I am still looking for audience feedback on how you want to give us money. If, if, you, do not, if you do not give any feedback, you, you might just, just decide some ways. Yeah, which, uh, you know, I know that I had Zany with me uh, on the last episode, and he's just like, you should do the Patreon. Uh, I am not completely opposed to Patreon, uh, but yeah. I am opposed to putting in extra work just for Patreon. Same. <laughs> so uh when we have when we have uh ads yeah that then patreon will make sense because we could then sell uh uh ad free feed but yeah now but you know we don't uh, have ads yeah yeah it doesn't I make could sense just i could just set up a patreon and just uh have the have there have a bucket there that you can just uh subscribe to and you know just toss a dollar or two into which, hey, yeah. I'm not opposed to that. I mean, yes, it it's not free uh, for us to run this, but it's also not expensive. And I, yeah. I can float the cost. So it, it's perfectly fine. Uh, I I knew I, I knew how much I was going to be spending going into this. So it's so it, it's budgeted for. I'm, I'm not out of money, I swear. <laughs> but it would be honestly, in my opinion, it would be better if if we could be net zero on the podcast yeah. or yes. better for uh, that, him. That that is that is the uh, long term goal is to break even, yeah. uh, ideally make a profit. We have a lofty goal. Yeah, uh, yeah. Lofty make goals. lofty goals, but hey, you know what? Uh, I am perfectly fine with how it's going right now. Yeah. Uh, but uh, bear in mind that as the as the show grows and gets more popular, uh, more downloads are going to happen. Yeah. And when more downloads come happen, that's then we start have to worry about network costs. Yeah. And transmission fees. And uh those definitely aren't free. And storage <laughs> costs and those aren't free. Yeah. Yeah. Thankfully our episodes are small because I because I do do a, a, do good editing and my editing software does good good 96 96k uh in the bits beating that Audio oh things, no! No, audio no, no. Files you did too. not just tell the audio files what our bitrate was, did you? <laughs> I think so. Some 
Some okay, small audio fi- Okay, audio files. I know we just triggered you, and I know I, I know that now you actively want to shout at us. Okay. So, uh, okay. He- I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna take this opportunity. Audio files. If you want as high of a bitrate as possible, tell me, and give me money. Give give uh, Josh money, and <laughs> I can make you a feed. At least for the new episodes, because old ones, I don't, I don't think I have all the files required anymore, because storage costs. Again, if if you'll pay me a lot, lots and lots of money, I I can store all files. But at this time, we cannot store raw files, so we cannot make good, good old content anymore. I can just remaster this by basically artificially bumping it up so it, so it looks in the metadata better, but it won't be any better in reality. <laughs> but for the new episodes, if you if you really want to, uh, throw a bunch of money at Josh, and I can make you a feed that will each episode will be as big as possible because it has high bit rate as possible. I think it can go to many. To many many hundreds in my editor so i know i can i know i can go. record at mo- at most in OBS, which i'm currently using to make these recordings uh 320 kilobits which is plenty for audio yeah we, we can plenty. go I, we can I, record I, on that that far and we can even then do some like editing and the magic there and get it as high as possible if you want it but you have to pay us for that that that's that's a patreon tier possibly oh, <laughs> the uh, audio there file we go tier. that's a patreon tier uh, pay, uh subscribe to the five dollar subscribe to the dollar tier that way you could just have have you know that good old pat on the back good good job bro tier uh two dollars to get ad free and then five dollars for high quality <laughs> for the for the way too much quality yeah which, which, which uh, really doesn't which, matter uh, my camera can theoretically do 4K, so I could I could yeah. upgrade my own video quality to 4K if you really want me to. Fun fact: if you, I, I already record in 4K, and technically speaking, we already do 4K upload to YouTube. But what what we can do because I I am that kind of insane guy, we can record both record in 4K and we can make this video in 8K. My computer can do it. We could. We Although could. it would be slow and a lot of electricity would be used, but and it we could do 8K. it would take us four and a half years to upload it, probably. No, but, hey. it should take... My internet is pretty fast. It should take probably a day or two. But yeah. Oh. Um, again, Patreon tier. <laughs> <laughs> but 8K hey, video. Uh, if, if, you know, you're now excited to shout at us, we have an email that you can send us send us an email to. It is contact at tuxbase dot com, uh, and you know I appreciate it when you do send us an email. Uh, we haven't got one for a hot minute, so uh, maybe this email thing might not work. I don't know. Are you sending us emails? Who maybe knows? But them. you know, yeah, yeah. We haven't received any, so uh, I don't know if it's actually working. But hey, if you if you if you are sending us emails and you have a Mastodon service or you're looking at uh, forming a Mastodon service. We have these links that I hope are randomly appearing on the screen right now. Yeah. I don't know if they are. I never know if they are because I never see them because I don't watch <laughs> my own videos. <laughs> and at this point, I should probably tell you that one of them won't work. Oh, right, at least right, for a right. while. Uh, yeah. Uh, because I have because, to you know, rebuild my Mastodon account. My yeah, Mastodon somebody's... Server. Yeah, somebody screwed up their database. Yes, I didn't have backups, and then couldn't couldn't uh, do the proper thing. So now I have to do some really magical things. It, it's, it's gonna fine. it's gonna be fun few days. Yeah, it's I, gonna be a project. It's, it's, it's probably gonna be gonna be a lot, lot lots of lots of beers as well. Uh, it's gonna be lots of beers, a lot of trial and error. Yeah. But I'll be honest with you, when it comes to fixing a broken thing. Uh, especially when you know it's just like a passion project. I never have more fun. Yeah, uh, it's gonna be fun. Like it's gonna be real now, fun. I don't know. I don't know what it is because you kind of feel like a masochist when when you come <laughs> come around to admitting it. But hey, <laughs> sometimes fun. you know fix it. Uh, sometimes fixing broken stuff is a lot of fun, or you know being involved yeah. in fixing the broken stuff or finding the broken stuff. Going like, hey, we finally broke it. <laughs> the, finding that solution is really that. You should know. We're all here. We're all engineers. We're all Linux people. Are or engineering mindset. You know. You know that. Uh, you know that uh, that having 
no bugs is just a bug exactly there's no something such thing not being offer. not being totally yeah. not being broken at all is actually actually a broken broken thing in itself yeah uh i can't tell you how many times uh where i've been working this this is like years ago but in world of warcraft uh they use they use lua for like their user interface and uh, i used to tinker around with like making my own world of warcraft add-ons they have this function called create frame which you can set a size to it and basically just draw a box, right? Can't be any more difficult than that. It turns out that their UI that their UI library code is extremely buggy and it gets a lot more complicated than just spawning an empty window. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there is no such thing as bug free software. If there is a bug if there is such a thing as bug free software, that is a bug because there is a bug somewhere. Because, you know, it could be as simple as an extra white space. Or, hey, you could be doing this certain line better. There is yeah. always a bug to be... There are always bugs to be fixed. And as such, there is always... As as consequence, there is always soft, software security patches that need to be applied. Yeah, and... So... If you, if you found this episode depressing because there was too much security security vulnerability stuff i'm sorry that's that's one of the main things i watch lately because it's interesting i used to be in security yeah it's it's interesting and uh you know sometimes you just go like i never you you you're reading about some of these bugs and you're just like uh hey i never knew that this was a thing and it is fascinating yeah. hearing about this you know like yeah. uh the the can't print on tuesday bug <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i i so i i've uh I've been wa I subscribed to these YouTubers, right? And uh, this YouTuber posted a video about it. Uh, he's an Australian guy. I'm certain that uh, as soon as I tell you guys that you you immediately know who I'm talking about. But he posted this video, and ever since he posted it, all these other outlets started referencing it again. And uh, I believe that it hit a couple podcasts where you know they joke about it, and it is yeah. just so fascinating for. To uh, see people relearn that this bug existed back in the day, <laughs> yeah. Which uh, you know, I'm running into a bit of a weird bug myself. Where currently I can't print from Firefox, but you know, if I download if I download the file as a as a or if I use Firefox to print it, print the file as a PDF, I can then use the LP command in my terminal to print. Which uh, we're we're going to be we're going to be working on squashing some bugs here. <laughs> wow, that's that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. It could be that you know the fact that you know I did a Gen two thing and I and I enabled cups and I haven't rebuilt the entire system get against cups yet. So maybe I just didn't compile Firefox with cup support. Which then why can't it print a PDF? Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, guys, uh, that's us for today. We will yeah. see you in the next episode. Hopefully, it comes out on time next week because apparently I forgot to hit upload on a recent episode. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and and then got republished because of me. Yep, and uh, hopefully this time we're gonna have proper show notes too. <laughs> Goodbye. We'll see ya.